You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today returning to the podcast is Phil Magnus. Phil, welcome back to Economics Detective Radio. Oh, thanks for having me again. So our topic for today is uh, James M. Buchanan, the Nobel laureate in economics who developed the field of public choice. And later on in the conversation, we'll be addressing some of the bizarre criticisms of him that have come out recently. So, uh, Phil, how about uh, you start by giving some background on Buchanan? Uh, what, what should someone know about him if they've never heard of him before? Yeah, so James Buchanan, is, uh, as you mentioned, he's uh, the uh, a Nobel laureate in economics who is basically considered one of the founding figures of the public choice school of thought. And this is the application of economic reasoning to uh, non-market decision-making, as he called it, or uh, I guess in more common parlance, uh, political decisions. So um, he really developed this school of thought as one of the main contributors, along with his co-author, uh, Gordon Tulloch. Uh, but also another set of economists uh, operating at uh, some other universities uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. It really kind of came into his own as part of a intellectual hub that was centered around the University of Virginia from the late 1950s through uh, the late 1960s. Mm. So clearly an eminent economist. And, you know, up till recently, uh, economists just kind of thought of him as this brilliant scholar who invented this whole sub-discipline of economics uh, called public choice. Right. And let's talk about public choice a little. It It's uh, sort of a natural outflow of, of all the ideas in economics about incentives and how people respond to them and how people, you know, how, how you can sort of draw non-obvious conclusions from looking at people's incentives and, and the structure of institutions in which they make choices. And it, you know, public choice just takes that and applies it to the public sector, which was a great oversight in economics prior to Buchanan. Right, you know, right. We had these wonderful tools and we we only we only applied them at first to market participants, but of course everyone responds to incentives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so prior to uh, Buchanan and a few other economists really digging into these issues, uh, you know, we were really coming out of a uh, a realm of political thought that tended to approach the actions of the state and really state actors as kind of these disinterested experts. Uh, this is the big uh, contribution that emerges in the early 20th century from the progressive movement, the idea that administrators should be like scientific experts that uh, – uh, lead us toward good governance through uh, disinterested policy. Uh, so Buchanan and uh, some of his fellow thinkers are in many ways a reaction, uh, a response to uh, some of the oversights and deficiencies of this public interest theory that emerges in the early 20th century. And you can kind of see how this would be um, you know, anathema to some of the progressive claims uh, that emerged out of the Woodrow Wilson administration and then particularly the New Deal, uh, because it introduces a level of skepticism about the ability of government actors to uh, actually execute on all of these promises uh, and claims that they're uh, they're proffering to uh, to correct things, such as well, they claim market failures can be uh, addressed by uh, overt government action. And Buchanan's kind of saying, "Wait a minute! Uh, if politicians and political actors uh, and bureaucrats and administrators are subject to some of the same considerations, same uh, motivations of interest as we find in uh, economic actors elsewhere." Uh, that puts certain limitations on what we can expect them to do and uh, their ability to actually execute on some of the claims that they're making, even if these uh, the underlying theories were uh, afforded some uh, validity, which he also kind of questions. Mm. Yeah, the thing with Buchanan is that he didn't invent the idea of applying science to politics. It's just before the science was, here's this science of how to make the best choices. And we sort of assume that, uh, you know, we have sort of an ideal theory of politicians as people who make decisions on the basis of science. So, right. so politics, the science of politics was how to make the best political decisions. 
not you know the science a science of politics in the sense that one as an outsider can study politics you know like like some anthropologist encountering a new tribe uh looking looking at what they're doing and why they're doing it uh without necessarily saying here's what they should do or or yeah. ought to do yeah he uh you know one of the uh catchphrases has always kind of accompanied the public choice movement is politics stripped of romance so you had this earlier romantic vision uh idealized vision of expert administrators and uh selfless politicians uh doing the public good serving the public and uh this new new school of thought kind of enters in and says uh, wait a minute uh these are not realistic assumptions look at what what happens in the real world when we assume that politicians uh not necessarily are strictly self-interested but uh, they do often look out for themselves look out for their reelections uh, and then he also asks the question what happens if we put politicians as human actors in certain institutional frameworks um institutions deriving from constitutional rules all the way down to principles of law and uh it turns out that those uh the rules of the of the game that are governing uh political actions have fairly substantial uh, impacts on what uh, can be done and what can be incentivized even in the public structure right so uh, do, do you want to pick one or two examples of uh you know incentive schemes that that lead politicians to not choose the the necessarily the social optimum as it were right right so the uh the, the most famous contribution that buchanan makes uh, and this is his book co-authored with gordon tullock called the calculus of consent uh and this is basically an attempt to look at decision rules under a constitutional framework and i guess the uh, the, the quick thirty thousand foot synopsis is uh, Buchanan and Tulloch uh, really question the idea that our, our, our simple notion of a majority of 50% plus one uh, is going to lead to the best or, or uh, most desirable democratic output. And what they really do is they compare uh, the decision costs of um, arriving at a political decision with the external costs of that decision itself. So, for example, if a uh, decision rule is set too low, uh, it could be the case that a minor- minority faction of the government uh, is able to shift the tax burden for all the things that it wants to do and some of the compliance burdens of all the uh, uh, regulatory mandates or laws it seeks to enact onto people that are outside of its voting block, outside of its voting majority. Uh, so the big thing for Buchanan and Tulloch is figuring out a voting rule for adopting legislation, adopting policies that attempts to minimize this ability of uh, segments of the electorate to impose the costs of their decisions, the burdens of their decisions onto everyone else that's excluded from that, uh, whatever that voting rule majority or, uh, or consensus point happens to be. Yeah. And the important point or an important point is that it's, it's not just to say that super majorities are always better or ev- everything should be decided by, by unanimous consent. And they make points like, um, if uh, there are really low stakes decisions, like what what kind of paper the uh, you know the bill is going to be written on, right. <laughs> then it's fine to have just a, a single decision maker decide for everyone because it just doesn't matter that much. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's the major decision. So so they uh, they tend to favor voting rules and major expensive uh, government actions that. Uh, that move towards uh, a higher level of consensus. So the idea is the closer you get to unanimity, uh, that, that means all people that are affected by and are participants in the decision have to agree to it in order for it to pass, uh, the less likely you are to have decisions that impose costs on people um, external to that decision because uh, you know you bring everyone into the fold. And what this does is it makes them a bit more budget conscious. It makes them uh, more attentive to uh, whether or not the policies they're enacting are uh, respectful of uh, the rights of people that are affected by those policies. So a whole number of considerations are brought into the fold when you have a higher consensus rule, a uh, higher decision uh, threshold effectively for uh, for legislation. And, you know, they look to the United States. One of the beauties of uh, the American Constitution 
is that through various mechanisms of checks and balances, they do tend to work in certain scenarios and certain situations of pushing that decision threshold upward. Uh, so, for example, the House and the Senate have to come together uh, and agree on the same bill, even though it's derivative of two separate chambers. There are other uh, additional checks on that uh, before legislation becomes law. And Buchanan and Tulloch's uh, framework applied to this basically says that uh, you know our constitutional mechanisms are geared towards uh, upping that uh, that decision rule threshold to a higher level. Uh, and then you know this is straight out of the Madisonian system. Uh, Madisonian theory of the faction. The idea is that you don't want to create a uh, a system of government where any one faction can uh, rule tyrannical over the rest or impose its will upon the rest. Rather, you divide up the powers, uh, divide up the interests, make them uh, pull pull them into competition with each other, and put a very very high threshold on uh, the minimum level that must be attained for legislation to pass through. Uh, therefore, you encompass something that uh, is going to be representative of a uh, a larger number of stakeholders in the game. Mm. And thing, things like, uh, just to add to your point about the American system having a very high bar, you need two-thirds of the states to make a constitutional amendment, which is just... Right, right. So that, that's a good example of a very high decision rule. And, you know, constitutional amendments are, are big stake decisions. Their, their outcomes could be uh, um, astronomical in their effects. So we, we want a decision rule that uh, is very high in uh, our ability to alter the Constitution, knowing that uh, those stakes are probably going to affect lots of people. And, uh, of course, Buchanan didn't only make this one contribution. Uh, he, he has uh, uh, another book uh Called uh, cost and choice, where he yeah. where he expands on the idea of opportunity cost. Uh, do you want to give a brief out, outline of that? Well, I guess I can get get a little bit into uh, so cost and choice is uh, is really kind of a fascinating blending of uh, old school Chicago price theory uh, brings in concepts of subjective value, and he also kind of has uh, insights that he draws upon um, Austrian thought. Uh, so it's kind of a, a merging of uh, of two or three classical liberal traditions uh, that come together. And there's actually a major figure that uh, that Buchanan later identifies as a um, uh, one of his influences behind cost and choice that comes into, I guess, the larger story we're going to get into of uh, what's going on at UVA in the 1950s and 60s. And that's a um, an early 20th century economist uh, by the name of William H. Hutt out of the University of Cape Town. Um, in South Africa, who in the early 20th century uh, really starts doing some interesting explorations of subjective valuation in response to the Keynesian ascendance that occurred in the economics profession. Uh, so Buchanan draws upon those insights as well. Uh, and, they're, and they're again uh, quasi Austrian uh, to some degree, but Buchanan himself is trained out of the old Frank Knight Chicago price theory tradition. Uh, so this is a type of a book that uh, that really sets a uh, a price theory framework for classical liberalism uh, and a certain school of economics that derives out of that. So he has extensive influence uh, that come from this particular contribution. All right. So so now I'm fairly confident that the listeners have have some idea of uh, who James Buchanan is and you know what his contributions are. And I mentioned at the the start, but of course he wins the Nobel Prize in 1986, most mostly for the calculus of consent. Uh, Tulloch is excluded from this prize, and it's kind of viewed in many circles as a pretty big oversight, maybe a, a bit of a snub to Tulloch. Actually, a lot of a snub to Tulloch. Right. <laughs> but you know, a highly influential person, highly respected among economists. Not until recently, a, a household name uh, among non-economists. Yeah, yeah. But in the econ profession, he is the type of figure that has multiple papers in top journals in the American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy. And these are not just uh, passing papers. They're formative theoretical groundwork of major concepts in economics today. They're papers that have 10,000 citations to them. So uh, a very big name, one of the most widely cited uh, figures of the economics profession from the mid-20th century within the profession itself, even though uh, most people, like, like the average uh, person, 
probably couldn't even name an economist beyond Adam Smith or maybe Keynes. Uh, those are uh, are the two that you basically learn in in high school economics class. But uh, at least in the profession itself, uh, Buchanan is certainly a major figure. Yeah, and um, comparing to some other Nobel prizes are are sometimes given out in sort of a flavor of the month way. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize is mm-hmm. one where they, you know, they famously gave it to President Obama right at the start of his uh, his term in office because he was doing things that they liked. But if uh, the Nobel Peace Prize worked the way the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics does, you'd have to wait 30 years and then see if the the effect of the person's actions is, you know, clearly positive and very influential. And, uh, and then, then only then do you give them the, uh, the no- Nobel. So, uh, basically the, if somebody has a Nobel prize in economics, it's not only that they made great contributions and did great work. It's that that work, uh, was fruitful and, and spawned a whole lot of other work. Uh, and, and we've, you know, waited long enough to see that, yes, indeed, this is this has made an important impact. So um, let's move to um, Democracy in Chains. So la- last year, 2017, uh, a book comes out about Buchanan uh, by a Duke historian, Nancy McLean. So this isn't something that uh, someone just self-published out of their basement. This is a, a fairly high-profile person. Uh, writing about uh, this influential Nobel-winning economist, and it's kind of a a, a hit piece on on Buchanan. Uh, do you want to explain sort of the the general thesis of the book? Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting to ask the question again: where to start? Uh, so McLean is a historian. Uh, she focuses on social movements, in particular in the 20th century United States. Uh, you know, a fairly distinguished figure in her own uh, realm, uh, although a, a certainly, and I, I think she'd, she'd openly admit this, a, a historian who comes from the far political left. Uh, so she's not someone that has uh, historically been versed in, in economic debates, although she ventures into them from a political perspective. And uh, McLean's basic thesis is she, she stumbled across Buchanan's name while researching uh, the resistance to Brown versus Board of Education as it played out in the 1950s and 1960s South. Uh, so she stumbled across his name in relation to a, a fairly obscure article that he had written. And the rest of her book consists of her basically shoehorning Buchanan into, into uh, this narrative where he becomes the central conspiratorial figure at the root of a uh, kind of a more academic y. Uh, resistance to uh, desegregation in the South, and then later t- take some of the ideas that he allegedly derives and develops in response to desegregation, according to her telling, and turns them into public choice theory, which she she sees as kind of this nefar- nefarious um, approach to destabilizing confidence in government, destabilizing the ability of uh, of the citizenry to to view their government as a uh, a force for good that she she likes in her progressive framework. And she kind of sees and depicts Buchanan as really the source of all that uh, uh, she considers ill with our political system uh, from basically the mid 20th century through today. Right. It, it sort of reminds me of... Uh... Naomi Klein putting uh, Milton Friedman at the center of the right wing conspiracy to destroy everything or something. This isn't just uh, someone writing a, a random blog post. Uh, this is, you know, a high profile scholar, and so, and Buchanan, you know, he's not, he's not like a some figure out of distant history. He he only passed away in 2013, and many people who worked with him are still around and are, are now sort of bearing the label of uh anti desegregationists if without if they don't uh, respond to this uh this book so tell me about the uh the article that she found the the obscure Buchanan article that sh- that she found that was the sort of uh first link in the chain for her yeah connecting yeah. Buchanan to this yeah so in uh, in 1959 um uh, in the state of Virginia they were coming out of a, um, a very intense period uh, 
of what was referred to as the massive resistance movement against desegregation. And this was a uh, kind of the brainchild of the state's uh, U.S. senator at the time, who was also the head of a, uh, a family-oriented political machine, this Harry Flood Bird Sr., uh, so a very prominent uh, mid-20th century political figure, but he was also an ardent segregationist. And Brown versus Board is decided in 1954. That uh, That's a case out of Kansas, but it also affects uh, school districts across the uh, mostly the southern United States where segregation had been the norm. Uh, basically rules that separate but equal is unconstitutional and orders the, uh, the integration of uh, public school systems. So one of the things that happens in Virginia under Byrd's um, response to this is he announces that the state is going to uh, effectively adopt laws that impose massive resistance to court-ordered desegregation from the federal level. And these include a, um, a series of laws that um, go even so far as to uh, allowing the state to step in and order the closure of public school districts that are facing federal court uh, desegregation. And the idea that Byrd uh, had was that uh, funds could then be transferred out of the public school system into uh, what were referred to as these private segregation academies, uh, effectively a privately operated but publicly funded school for white children only that could exclude black children. Uh, So this is one of the tactics that he adopts. Uh, There's a whole package of legislation that partially enacts uh, massive resistance between 1956 and 1958. Uh, But this uh, immediately, it it attracts the attention of critics. So in 1958, a series of lawsuits are filed against the state of Virginia, both at the state level and the federal level, over uh, this package of laws that had been enacted. Uh, And this included... uh, several school districts that had uh, been ordered to close their public schools to avoid uh, integration. And this really takes place in the fall of 1958. Uh, So all of this comes to a head in January 1959, when uh, on the same day, the state and federal uh, courts ruled against the massive resistance legislation. They found that it was unconstitutional on a number of different levels. So this throws um, the Virginia legislature kind of into chaos for a brief period. Uh, what do we do with our school system? How uh, how do we respond to these uh, these court ordered uh, rulings that uh, have basically stricken what we had just put on the board uh, as a resistance measure to, to segregation uh, off the record? So what happens in the spring uh, of 1959 is the legislature convenes uh, to basically deal with this what's referred to as the Virginia school crisis and uh, one of the ideas that they come up with is a means to uh, to kind of ease the process of segregation uh, they start investigating a rudimentary school voucher system and the idea here would be that uh, parents could be afforded a grant of up to, I think it's $250 through the state if they wanted to move their children to another school beyond the one that they're attending. And of course, there are uh, segregationist overtones uh, to some of this policy. The idea is that uh, parents of white children that are attending a school facing court-ordered integration could then remove those, uh, those students from that school and send them to another school on the voucher, both public or private. But because the court rulings are, uh, compliant with and consistent with Brown versus Board, uh, the state legislature also recognizes that it cannot enact these uh, these vouchers on racial terms. They have to be race neutral. In other words, if they extend a voucher to uh, to white students, they also have to extend them to black students. Uh, this is very clear in the way that the law is written. Uh, they also have to extend them to any student that wants to use a voucher for non-segregationist reasons. So if uh, if a parent wants to just send their kids to a private school out of state, they could also apply for a voucher effectively. So uh, this is the scenario that's emerging in the uh, in the legislature uh, among the med- many different options they're considering on, on what to do with the school system. In February and March 1959, Buchanan and his colleague at the University of Virginia, uh, Warren Nutter, is another economist out of Chicago. Uh, they draft a short article that explores the economics of a functional voucher system. Uh, both of these guys are from the University of Chicago, which we know very famously is associated with Milton Friedman's uh, foray into the voucher issue. Uh, Friedman wrote a very famous article laying out the theater- theoretical groundwork of school vouchers in 1955. So uh, Buchanan and Nutter 
draw very heavily on uh, what's considered kind of a new frontier of economic explorations and education. So they draft this article in the spring of 1959, outlining basically how a voucher system would operate and what are the, uh, you know, they they go through all the different trade-offs versus other types of educational systems. And they publish it in April 1959 as an attempt to uh, inform the debate that's going on in Richmond and the legislature from the distance. But they're trying to inject uh, at least some economic knowledge and some economic background into into this debate that's uh, otherwise really kind of running wild in all sorts of different directions uh, caused mostly by the segregation issue. So uh, where McLean comes in is she discovered a footnote to this article that they published in 1959. And it's a really straightforward kind of statement of the economic case for vouchers. But she discovered a footnote to it in the uh, work of another historian, um, a fellow by the name of James Hirschman, uh, from a book that he published in the late 1990s, where uh, Hirschman mistakenly identified this Buchanan Nutter article as being associated with the massive resistors. And in particular, a newspaper editor from Richmond uh, by the name of James J. Kilpatrick. And uh, Kilpatrick is the editor of the Richmond News Leader, which was kind of the front of the bird machine in the 1950s, uh, the most uh, um, aggressive of the segregationist newspapers in terms of its editorial line. So uh, Hirschman in his uh, his book in the late 1990s mistakenly asserted that Buchanan and Nutter had published their uh, their article in Kilpatrick's Richmond News Leader, uh, so McLean comes across this and uh, thinks she has an aha moment and basically kind of runs with it and assumes that she's discovered uh, the nefarious uh, Chicago school inspired neoliberal conspiracy to prop up a uh, massive resistance to desegregation. Uh, so that's kind of the starting point of her foray into uh, Buchanan's uh, work. And she really takes it from there and runs with it in all sorts of uh, of extremely uh, far fetched and increasingly strained uh, directions. Mm. So it comes from. So ultimately, this footnote misattributes the article, and it implies that it was. Yeah, in a way, her entire project uh, almost reduces down to a typo in a footnote that she misread. <laughs> wow. So so yeah, this this footnote. It places the Buchanan article in a segregationist uh, newspaper, or you know, a, a seg- segregationist publication. Right. Uh, where where is it actually published? So it's actually published in the competitor, which was the Richmond Times Dispatch, the paper that still exists today. And the interesting thing about the Times Dispatch is, uh, well, first off, its editor. Um, it's kind of one of these unique characters of uh, of mid twentieth century Virginia. It's a fellow by the name of Virginia Stabney. Uh, he's from an old, uh, old school Virginia family that's steeped in, uh, you know, go, probably goes all, almost all the way back to Jamestown. Uh, so very much one of the first families of the state. Uh, his father was a UVA professor of uh, history, I believe, but um, a very famous and distinguished editor. Uh, Dabney was, in some respects, a racial liberal. So in the early 20th century, he uh, he assumes editorship of the Times-Dispatch. I think it was in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, he actually wins the Pulitzer Prize, uh, I believe it was 1948, for a series of editorials that he wrote advocating for desegregation in the uh, Richmond uh, streetcar system. Uh, so he is a racial liberal to some degree, but he's also uneasy about the Brown decision. Uh, and he makes this known in the 1950s. He sees it as uh, as too fast, too socially disruptive. Uh, so he has an element of uh, a racial conservatism in him as well. But he's really kind of a mixed and in some ways tragic figure of uh, of the whole civil rights and desegregation era. Someone who uh, is sympathetic to uh, improving the rights and conditions of African Americans, but is also uh, kind of mired in uh, mid century Virginia culture. But the interesting thing about Dabney is throughout the uh, the civil rights era, uh, he actually gains uh, quite a bit of acclaim for maintaining a fairly open uh, acceptance policy on his editorial page to uh, an open discussion of the desegregation issue. So, uh, for example, the uh, the head of the NAACP, the national NAACP in 1958, came to Richmond and, and uh, did a rally there where he uh, – 
specifically acknowledged Dabney in the Times Dispatch. She says that uh, even though they editorially disagree with the NAACP's position of uh, bringing about uh, uh, school integration on an immediate term, uh, they have always been fair to us. They've allowed uh, our writers to publish letters and op-eds and, and that sort of thing in their paper to give it a full uh, airing. And uh, so this is Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, basically says the Times Dispatch uh, compared to any other newspaper in the South is the most open forum that uh, we've been able to find. Uh, so this is important for the context of the Buchanan Nutter uh, paper because they publish in the Times Dispatch rather than the news leader. And the implication here is that they were going with the statewide newspaper, the uh, the largest uh, state daily paper that actually had an audience on both sides of the segregation debate, actually had readership from across the spectrum. Uh, so that's a very different story than writing for uh, uh, Kilpatrick's segregationist rag that's uh, that's advocating things at the time, like uh, uh, invoking the theories of John C. Calhoun to nullify uh, federal court orders and going in a really extreme direction to fight back against Brown. Uh, so uh, the story here is that Buchanan and Nutter picked a very different paper for a very different reason. And uh, McLean almost entirely misses that distinction because she was led astray by the initial footnote. Mm. And where does she trace this, you know, this connection between Buchanan and Segre- the segregationists like where where does you know from that initial footnote yeah yeah what what other connections does she draw well quite a bit of it is her interpretation of the voucher debate that was playing out in virginia uh so she draws upon uh kind of this idea that's that's come into vogue recently in uh, a lot of the teachers union and anti-voucher advocate circles, uh, they have been basically been advancing a very tendentious and, uh, and partial historical claim that vouchers emerged in the 1950s and 60s as a backdoor way to de- defeat uh, desegregation. Uh, so this has really become popular among uh, stuff like the American Federation of Teachers is one of their talking points in recent years as they've lost the, the voucher debate on other fronts on economic grounds. So they say that it's, it's tainted in its origin. And part of this comes from a misreading of where vouchers fit into the desegregation case because they did emerge simultaneously with school desegregation. But what you actually have, uh, especially in Virginia, and we think that Buchanan, for all intents and purposes, is aware of this, especially in Virginia – uh, you had voucher advocates on both sides of the desegregation issue. So there are some people that see it as a segregationist tool, other people that see it as a threat to uh, maintaining segregation, a threat to massive resistance. And Buchanan acknowledges this in some of the works that uh, McLean overlooked uh, that come from his study of the issue. Yeah, the the thing about vouchers is it really is just – more or less letting the market decide uh, they they can be instituted right. in different ways with different rules but uh you know i i think the the segregationists well i think both sides uh the segregationists thought that uh segregation was obviously good or desirable or that people really wanted it and that uh it was the, the you know these met outside meddlers forcing desegregation and the desegregationists probably thought exactly the opposite that this government was forcing segregation on people who didn't want it. Right, right. And, you know, I I tend to agree with the latter that, you know, if you just had a free market in in schools, probably most of the schools, uh, you know, absent any legal rule to uh, about who they must allow and who they who they can't, most of the schools would probably take the money from anyone regardless of their race because businesses tend to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I might not be correct on that, but it, it does, it seems like something that could plausibly uh, lead to segregation or desegregation. Yeah. And it's a messy issue. Uh, when Friedman first frames the issue in 1955, he's aware of this and he, had, he includes a, uh, a very lengthy footnote um, on his initial proposals relation to segregation. And it has a lot of caveats in it that are really uh, fascinating and often overlooked. Uh, one of them, he says that, uh, you know, in a world where uh, we, our only choices are, are forced segregation and forced desegregation, uh, he is unambiguously in the latter category. We need to get rid mm-hmm. of segregation. 
but he also thinks that vouchers are a, um, a better and more effective long-term way to accomplish this. So his idea is exactly what you stated. You introduce competition into the education system, and desegregation wins out economically in the long run. Uh, there may be the case that some segregationists use vouchers in the short run to uh, pull their kids out of schools that are facing integration, but he thinks that uh, market forces, market um, institutions will induce uh, – a, uh, a favor to shift toward desegregation in the long run. So if you simply introduce this element of choice, uh, choice will win out in the favor of desegregation. So he sees vouchers as a way of actually chipping away and undermining um, previous segregation of structures that are still very much in place across the South at that time. And by all indication, Buchanan and Nutter when they write their article, they, they basically see the same thing. They're on the same terms that Friedman is on this particular issue. Uh, in fact, they share an early copy of the article with Friedman and say, hey, can you give us some comments? And he writes back and says, you know, there's a, there's an ill, will blo- Ill wind blowing in uh, the segregationist debate. But perhaps uh, if you throw the voucher ar- argument out there, you make the, the voucher argument in, in very clear – neutral academic terms, uh, you can inject some sensibility into this uh, this crazy discussion that's playing out and maybe do some good in the long run. Uh, so Buchanan and Nutter are also very aware of this and uh, what McLean really doesn't acknowledge, but uh, we find in further archival evidence is five years after this article is published, they revisit it with a second study. And the second study is to see how the voucher system has performed over the previous five years. And one of the key points that they keep stressing in the second study is that an increasing number of African Americans are using the voucher system uh, to move their their children out of previously segregated schools and in, into integrated schools, schools that are permitting black students to enroll. So uh, they do see uh, early evidence that the voucher system is working, uh, basically as Friedman predicted, that it's chipping away at the segregationist system. Uh, and in so doing, they also point out that the biggest resistance to vouchers uh, as of 1964, when this report is written, is actually the Virginia Education Association, the, the state teachers union, or the white state teachers union. So it was segregated at that time, which had actually teamed up with the remaining segregationists to oppose vouchers on uh, pro-segregation grounds. So they thought vouchers were actually chipping away at the public school system. Uh, which also had lingering vestiges of segregation, uh, still very much alive and active at that point. So you have a uh, almost an inversion of the alliance that McLean claims. She thinks that Buchanan has allied with the uh, the segregationists. In fact, it's the opposite that's true. It's the teachers' unions that had allied with the uh, segregationists uh, and did so specifically because they thought vouchers were undermining segregation. So, so the vouchers were brought in as a by segregationists as a way to try to defend segregation. And then five years later, they things flipped because the results of those vouchers were not what the segregationists had expected. Is that, is that the case? Well, it's, I think it's only partially the case. Uh, There are certainly some people that want vouchers for segregationist motives, but there are other people, uh, another factor that's, that's very big in the debate at the time uh, religious leaders, people that have religious schools and send their children to religious schools are very interested in vouchers at the time. And this derives out of a, uh, a 19th century uh, hostility to minority religious viewpoints, uh, particularly uh, Catholicism uh, had, uh, especially in the South, been uh, seen in very prejudicial ways. And a lot of the uh, the public school systems that emerged in the late 19th and early 20th centuries uh, had explicit secular dimensions that were intended to uh, discriminate against uh, private Catholic schools, for example, uh, which were seen as educational com- competitors. So uh, kind of missing from the story is that there are other people that have stakes in the voucher issue uh, in the 1950s and 20 and, and 1960s beyond people that are uh, affected by segregation. So uh, while some segregationists do view, view vouchers as a way to pull their own kids out of a school facing integration, uh, they very quickly discover, and this is recognized as early as the debate itself in 1959, that vouchers could also potentially threaten and undermine segregation. 
So one of the discoveries that I made while researching this uh, actually comes from Buchanan's hometown at the time, Charlottesville. So that's where the location of the University of Virginia is. In the spring of 1959, as all of this debate is playing out in Charlottesville, and as Buchanan and Nutter are writing their paper, uh, there's a lawsuit brought by the NAACP to force the integration of two local schools in Charlottesville. And it's resisted by the uh, the white majority in the population because they don't want uh, the schools integrated. And the city of Charlottesville uh, has a retained attorney who's a specialist in civil rights cases and, and basically fighting off the NAACP segregation uh, lawsuit uh, by the name of John S. Battle, Jr., Battle is a uh, is very steeped in connections to the state political elite. He's the son of a former governor, uh, is a major player in the Democratic Party of, uh, of mid 20th century Virginia, part of the bird machine, uh, has connections up and down throughout the state political elite. He's also a segregationist that's aligned with the massive resistors. And what he discovers and, and the argument he really makes in, in 1959 is he thinks that there's a problem with the way that the voucher system is going to play out. Uh, He notices that in order to be court compliant, vouchers cannot be denied to any any student of any race that that requires it. But he also notices that in order to be uh, court compliant, the local school district can no longer use race as an overt category on determining admission. So he proposes this kind of backdoor segregationist scheme of his own and uh, to the Charlottesville School Board basically tells them they can control the number of black students that enroll in white elementary schools and white high schools by using geographic zoning and using uh, a, t- a new tool that they kind of invented at the time. These are enrollment caps, basically saying that the school is at capacity. So even if a black student wanted to enroll, they just don't have space for them. So he said uh, he urged the city to deploy these two tools, zone all the black kids to a designated black elementary school that wasn't officially segregated, but uh, by de facto means, that's where they're all sent. And anyone that wants to transfer into the white school, we keep them out by strictly capping enrollment at a uh, at a maximum and claiming the schools at capacity. So this is uh, John Battle's scheme for preserving segregation in Charlottesville. Uh, the voucher scheme emerges simultaneous to this, and it's being considered in the legislature. And he kind of freaks out when he sees some of the implications of the vouchers, because one of the things that could happen, let's say a, uh, a parent that has deep racist motivations, is deeply committed to segregation, removes his or her student from the white elementary school uh, that has a tuition or has a, um, an enrollment cap on it in Charlottesville at that time. What does that do? It opens up a new seat that someone can enroll in. And the voucher scheme would allow a student from a black elementary school to transfer to the white elementary school and basically take that student's seat. So um, he views vouchers as kind of this uh, this two-part uh, assault upon this de facto attempt that he's trying to maintain segregation through uh, backdoor means of the enrollment cap and the geographic zoning. So for every white student that moved out of the uh, school facing integration, uh, opened up a new desk, opened up a new seat for a black student to enroll. And he goes on a series of uh, of public lectures, and I found some of the transcripts of these speeches. And these are in February and March and April 1959, right as the voucher issue is being debated, where he says that vouchers are going to lead to, quote, the Negro engulfment of our white public schools. Hmm. Uh, He says that basically it's going to work as Friedman intended, but Battle thinks this is a bad thing. Battle thinks this is uh, the death knell, this last-ditch effort to maintain segregation through backdoor ways. Uh, So he realizes this very early on. Uh, The other interesting thing about Battle's argument is it does actually diffuse across the state. And by 1964, that's where you get to the VEA, the Virginia Virginia Educators Association. They basically adopted uh, more or less the same argument. And they're publishing it in their statewide newsletter. Hmm. So, w- what ended up happening with the the uh, voucher system in Virginia? I I don't think it's still in place today, is it? Right, right, right. So, it, it was operational for in various forms for about a decade. Really, the uh, the full operational period lasted about five years. Uh, this is enacted in 1959 as kind of this transition phase. 
piece of race neutral legislation to comply with the court orders. It continues in operation through 1965 when there's a subsequent court order that limits uh, its use. What they found is that uh, uh, some schools were uh, taking voucher money but only admitting white students, so they had uh, private segregationist policies in place. And the Supreme Court comes back and rules that unconstitutional through various steps that follow from that. Uh, the system's basically defunded and dismantled, and the money's sent back into the public school system. Uh, one interesting thing, and this is where McLean goes in, in very uh, historically erroneous directions. Uh, so there was a famous case in another county in Virginia, uh, Prince Edward County, uh, county seat of Farmville. Uh, it's kind of loaded, located to the uh, the west of Richmond, very rural area, but it's a black majority area of the state at the time. And Prince Edward County uh, in 1959 as well adopted its own separate measure to prevent integration. They went to a radical extreme policy of shutting the entire school system down. And they did this in 1959 thinking, hey, wait a minute, uh, we can shut down our school system and then all the white kids can go to a private academy with the voucher system that the state has just enacted. And McLean sees this and she thinks, aha, uh, James Buchanan must have created and sponsored and laid the intellectual groundwork for this voucher system that allowed Prince Edward County uh, to do this awful maneuver to preserve segregation by shutting black students out of public schools uh, through the closing of public schools entirely. The problem with McLean's narrative is the NAACP immediately filed suit against Prince Edward County, and the federal court steps in and rules that voucher money is off limits to them, basically enjoins them from participating in the uh, uh, the state voucher system. So they don't they don't even have access to this money that they thought they were going to get uh, to fund a private white school system. In fact, it's it's legally barred by the courts all the way through 1964 when the Supreme Court steps in and shuts down the entire Prince Edward plan, which uh, had been sustained alternatively through private money at that point. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an odd connection. It's, you know, li- like blaming someone who, who invents some kind of hammer for, for, when someone else takes that hammer and murders someone, it, it's just such a tenuous connection, right? Uh, you, you you write an article about okay, here's the you know here is the economic impact of a voucher system. It does this, it does this, it does this, and then someone else tries to use that system for some bad purpose, and suddenly you're the architect of of that totally yeah, yeah. unrelated action. Yeah, and not only that, the unrelated action is uh, almost immediately shut down by the courts uh, because they really were misusing the voucher system from its um, the way that it was written into the statute. The federal court cited the 1959 statute and says, "Wait a minute! Uh, when you adopted this, you ruled that it had to be race neutral, and uh, that's very clearly not the case in the way that Prince Edward County was using it." Uh, so yeah, it's it's a very odd way to try and blame Buchanan for the actions of other people. And then meanwhile, you know, as, as I discussed, uh, you have this local situation going on on the ground in Charlottesville, right in his back door, where the local segregationists are, are almost rapidly anti-voucher. Uh, so and McLean's completely missing, ignoring, not even investigating that aspect of the story. You know, this is an inference, but uh, I, I'd imagine Buchanan and Nutter read the local newspaper and were probably aware of what the local segregationists were doing. And this is immediately at the time that they're drafting and circulating their article. So uh, they're aware, uh, they're almost certainly aware of a segregationist anti-voucher coalition that had emerged locally in, in Charlottesville. And I very much doubt, based on their other writings and what we know about Buchanan's um, other views on on racial issues, I very much doubt that he approved of the way that the local segregationists were entering into the voucher debate. Yeah. Spe- speaking of Buchanan's other views, you briefly alluded earlier to uh, W. H. Hutt, uh, the South African yeah. uh, economist who uh, who Buchanan invited to the University of Virginia in 1965. Do you want to uh, say why that's significant? Yeah. So um, so Hutt is a very old school student that came out of the London School of Economics in the 1920s. He later um, kind of operated in the same circles that F.A. Hayek did. 
uh, in the early 20th century. So uh, he's not of uh, the Austrian school lineage in himself, but he's, he's very much seen as a fellow traveler. He emerges as a critic of Keynesian economics in the 1930s, establishes a, a very distinguished academic career at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, he's there from the uh, the late 1920s until 1964. He's a professor of economics and later head of the economics department at the University of Cape Town. The other fascinating thing about Hutt is he is a vigorous and outspoken opponent of South African apartheid. Uh, he does some academic work on apartheid. I've traced it in his work all the way to the uh, the early 1930s when he emerges as a critic of apartheid. He had written op-eds and letters to the editor of several newspapers in South Africa uh, denouncing this discriminatory uh, segregationist state that was emerging in his country at the time. And he actually turned some of his academic work to it as well. He suffers personally because of his opposition to apartheid. In 1955, Hutt wrote a series of newspaper editorials denouncing the policy and the South African government responded by seizing his passport to try to prevent him from going to academic conferences abroad where he could criticize apartheid. Uh, so this is a guy, he's not only uh, attacking it in the abstract, he's feeling the, per- the personal wrath of being a, um, a white academic in South Africa who opposes the state policy of uh, legalized discrimination. Uh, but Hutt, every time that he gets some backlash for this, he seems to double down. And in 1964, he writes down all of his ideas uh, about uh, the apartheid system uh, in a book form. It's a, uh, a book published in 64. Uh, the title is The Economics of the Color Bar. And what it really is is an early public choice application of economic logic and history to determine the origins and reasons why apartheid is sustained. So it's a he goes deep into the history of when the apartheid laws are enacted in the early 20th century, and he discovers by uh, reviewing archival evidence, legislative debates, all sorts of, of data that he brings to bear on this. He discovers that apartheid is basically enacted by white labor unions in South Africa to prevent labor competition from uh, the black labor force, basically a way to prop up their wages by uh, forcing black laborers out of the labor force in any way that it could compete with white people. So uh, this system of laws is kicked into uh, to gear on an economic basis and then over time emerges into a, a strict uh, form of racial separation that occurs at the national level in South Africa. So he applies public choice concepts uh, right at the outset of the time Buchanan's working on this simultaneously to dissect and diagnose and critique South African apartheid. Buchanan meets him, uh, meets Hutt at the uh, Mont Pelerin Society. They're, they're running in some of the same international economic circles. And in 1965, right after Hutt's retired from uh, uh, the University of Cape Town, Buchanan invites him to take up a, um, a visiting professorship at the University of Virginia for the next two years. So, uh, so Hutt arrives, I think it's in December of 1965. And one of the first things he does when he, uh, he gets to Charlottesville, is he looks around, he sees this uh, uh, desegregation debate that's been playing out for the better part of a decade now in the South. And he says, wait a minute, the laws that you have here appear to be of a very similar origin and a very similar type of a structure as what I've been fighting against in South Africa. Uh, So he gives a series of lectures at UVA in 1965 denouncing segregation and investigating it from a public choice perspective. Not only that, he also begins working on an academic article uh, that's published in 1966 in which he takes Buchanan and Tulloch's calculus of consent and says, let's take their constitutional framework, their voting rule and their unanimity principle, the stuff that we discussed at the beginning of the podcast, and say, what does that mean for anti-discrimination laws. And one of the implications is if you have a higher uh, voting threshold, the higher unit or so approach a unanimity rule in your constitutional design, then by definition, discriminatory laws that penalize people based on their race or their gender or their religion are going to uh, tend to be um, opposed by persons that are brought into the decision calculus. Uh, in other words, he viewed the calculus of consent as a means of setting up an abstract constitutional principle that could end 
uh, legalized discrimination. So he writes this as one of the first uh, commentaries on the calculus of consent after it's published. And we know from Buchanan's notes later that he's saying that uh, he was in full agreement with Hutt's article that came out in 1966 and thought it was an interesting application of his own theories. Uh, so the big implication here for McLean's story is having a figure like Hutt, who's a well-known anti-apartheid uh, crusader, who's a, um, a theorist of his own right in the public choice tradition that's making anti-discriminatory public choice arguments, is very inconsistent with this conspiratorial narrative that she has about uh, public choice theory being kind of a backdoor way to prop up segregation through uh, imposing school vouchers on people. Mm-hmm. We're getting to the end of our time. Uh, so I, I kind of wanted to discuss the impact of McLean's book. Uh, one of the most amazing things to come out of this whole controversy, I mean, McLean publishes the book uh, alleging this this grand conspiracy by uh, Buchanan to prop up segregation. And uh, people who worked with Buchanan or you know knew him personally or work within the public choice tradition. And so uh, are, are his intellectual heirs jumped up to de- defend him. But one of the most amazing things to come out of this is uh, some mainstream historians just sort of uncritically citing democracy in chains. Uh, do you want to uh, mention some of how some of that has happened recently? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's been a very strange episode to watch. And I say this as both a participant um, and just as a, uh, a person that's interested in the broader history of, uh, of economic thought. Uh, so McLean's book was published in June 2017, so it's been out just under a year now. Very early on, as some of us started reading it and finding that the passages and claims she was making were just uh, just out of sync with the evidence. There's no evidence for a lot of the uh, the bolder claims she was making, particularly in the racial stuff. So uh, we began writing critiques. Uh, I wrote a review essay and uh, and subsequently have uh, uh, co-authored a, a number of papers on this particular subject. But as we started critiquing some of the evidence, uh, you know, the normal scholarly response to getting criticized in reviews is to, uh, uh, to offer a defense or offer a, uh, a retort of your own um, if you're an author. But McLean didn't do that. Uh, just kind of out of the blue, a couple of weeks into um, the uh, the commentary that's emerging right after this book re- is released, she put up a post, I think it was on Facebook and a couple other uh, social media sites, where she alleged that there was a giant conspiracy orchestrated by the Koch brothers to destroy her book. And it had all sorts of weird conspiratorial claims in it. For example, she claimed that, uh, that people were buying Google uh, rankings. Which, uh, if you know anything about how Google works, it's, it's not possible to do that. She was claiming that people were nonetheless buying Google rankings that made the critical reviews appear above the positive reviews uh, for her book. Uh, and, of course, she, she alleged that this is coming from the Koch brothers as the funding source. Uh, she also claimed that there was a, uh, a conspiracy to downvote her on Amazon and the, uh, the star ratings that, uh, that, that readers give. So she kind of put out this call to action asking for all her uh, progressive political allies to come together and flood Amazon.com with uh, favorable reviews and favorable votes to uh, to prop up the books, so basically accusing everything that she accused her opponents of doing, she actually called the do. And this kind of sets off a firestorm in, of discussion in some of the academic presses. Uh, so she does an interview with the Chronicle of Higher Education in which she takes this increasingly conspiratorial line of why she's not engaging her critics, why she's not responding to her critics. Uh, one thing that comes out of it, and, and this is a later, um, I think it was either a lecture or an essay or something she had written after the, uh, the book was published. Uh, so the question is raised. She's a professor at Duke. Duke also has a public choice uh, influenced uh, presence in both the political science and economics departments there. So there are public choice scholars of, uh, of very high esteem, uh, Michael Munger and George Vanberg in particular. Uh, and then also one of Buchanan's um, uh, co-authors, Jeffrey Brennan, teaches at Duke as well. So the obvious question was put forth, why didn't Nancy McLean walk across campus and talk to any of these guys that knew James Buchanan and ask them maybe for input on her book, uh, maybe ask them to uh, review an advanced copy before this thing goes goes to press to see if she has the facts right. Uh, 
Uh, she didn't do any of that. And her, um, her response to uh, being posed this question is, well, she knew or she thought she knew that all of these scholars that were uh, friends with and collaborators with and former co-authors with Buchanan were part of the Koch network. And if she asked them anything about their, uh, their work, she'd tip them off to the fact that she was on their trail. So it's, uh, it's like this almost Alex Jonesy style conspiracy theory approach to doing history. Uh, and yet she, she seems to not only have bought into it, she's doubled and tripled down on this as the scholarly response uh, to criticisms of her work. So it's been, uh, I'd even go so far as to say it's been epistemically destructive to the way that we do history. And unfortunately, uh, she has a number of, uh, of political partisans, of people that agree with her uh, political message that uh, just credulously default into accepting uh, some of her more far-fetched claims is true now, despite uh, the fact that they've been undermined and critiqued on an evidentiary front, but despite the fact that quite a number of them have been debunked uh, very thoroughly. So you have this weird uh, scenario that's emerging where even though the book has been thoroughly criticized, and, and I'd argue on, on firm basis, I've done some of the criticism, but several other scholars have as well, you have a segment of the history profession that is kind of sticking its fingers in its ears and pretending as if uh, uh, the critics are uh, non-entities, non-players in the game, and that McLean, uh, because she is the victim of a conspiracy, is um, is nonetheless uh, surviving with her narrative intact. And therefore, they cite uh, some of her work uh, very credulously as if it's uh, it is now kind of a gospel truth when it's very far from the case uh, of that even being established. And on that rather sad note, uh, my guest today has been Phil Magnus. Uh, Phil, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Yeah, thanks again for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio. The discussion question for today, which we'll be discussing at Economics Detective on Facebook, it's a Facebook group you can join by request. The discussion question is, what's the most interesting conclusion of the public choice school or of Buchanan specifically, in your opinion? What's one insight from that school of thought that you think is particularly intriguing or well argued doesn't have to be something that you completely agree with um, but if you you disagree uh, say why Uh, I think that would be interesting so head on over to Facebook and look up economics detective and then request to join the group if you want to join this discussion thanks and I'll try to be back next week 